for the Neil Deal, just please don't lay down um, and fall asleep. The first sermon I ever preached, there were three people in the front row, and they were unconscious by the time I had gotten through the second minute, and I'm not joking. I'm not joking. And, uh, you know, that really is a real encouragement, you know, for someone who's 19. You know, you're like, gosh, am I that boring people fell asleep in uh, two minutes? I asked my mom after the service if it was really that boring, and she said, it'll get better, son. That's what she said. So, praise the Lord. I hope everybody's had a great week. I know it wasn't horribly warm this week until today. But you know what? Spring is here. Amen? I don't mind the snow, but when you have six months of it, it's, it's enough. Until next year, that's fine. I just want to remind everybody that next week is the first week in June. Is that correct? Because I know last week I said this week was the first week in June. But it's not. It's the 29th. Or the 28th. It's 28th. So next week is definitely the first week in June, I promise. So we will have communion next week. Okay? We have communion the first week of the month. Amen? I also want to be helped and encouraged by our messages here. Um, and they don't have Facebook. Just let them know that we're on YouTube. You can find us there if you just search for Promise of Life, Kate Breton. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, let's move on to the... Offering, if you would please turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now, we talk a lot about, um, at least the Lord has led me to talk a lot about when it comes to finances, that, it's, that tithing and sowing is part of our covenant relationship with God. Amen. It's not, it's not, it's not like we're pressuring people to give churches should not be pressuring people to give money. Amen. Because you, you know what, if, if God has called that church into existence and if God has called the church to do certain things that the pastor understands, then the, the pastor's job is to cast the vision before the people. Okay. The responsibility of the pastor is to say, listen, this is what the Lord has been talking to me about. This is what I believe that we're supposed to do. And then the pastor, this is what I've learned from my pastor, Pastor Craig Field, he just sets the vision and then let people catch it. Let the Spirit work on people yes. to catch that vision. Amen? Mm -hmm. But tithing is part of our covenant relationship with God. So if we are planted in a local church, if, there, if we're attending the church God has called us to, and God will confirm that to us, is that if we are where we're supposed to be, that's where our tithe belongs. Amen? It's, it's not that the church should be pressuring people to tithe. No, 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 no. It's if, if there are people in a church that won't tithe, God will make up the difference. Amen? Because you know what? If God plants the candlestick, God is going to ensure that that church will be financially successful. Amen? Whether it be by people who are tithing in the church, which is what the highest flow is. God desires that everyone who's a member of the local church to tithe to that church. But if people are not catching it, then God will find some other means to fund the vision of that church. Amen? Yeah. But we're talking about faithful people here today. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, we're looking at verse 6, okay? But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So we're talking about the, 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 the law of sowing and reaping here, what we call the uh, law of sowing and reaping. You see it throughout the Bible. Okay, it's not just in the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament too. God talks repeatedly about those who sow will reap. Amen? But it depends what you sow and how much you sow will determine your harvest. And we know that even in the, in the natural too. Amen? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Not based on pressure. Not based on pressure. For God loves a cheerful giver. Look, if, if the church is pressuring you to give, how can you be cheerful if someone is basically beating you up and saying, give me your money, give me your money? You know what I mean? Believe me, I mean, if that was, if, if that was what God blesses, then the, then, then the CRA is the most blessed of all institutions on this planet. <laughs> well, perhaps the, the Finnish government's worse because they, they have the highest taxes in the developed world, Finland does. But in, in any case, the CRA is not far behind. And God is able to make all grace 
and all power abound toward you, that you, you the giver, who gives cheerfully, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now, what does this mean? Let's break this down for a second. Having all sufficiency in all things. That means, let's think our heads, let's think back to, to what Jesus says in Matthew 6, okay? You know, cons- you know, consider the sparrows, consider the lilies, right? You know, don't worry about what, what you wear, what you eat, where you live, that sort of thing. So that's what we mean by all, that's what he means by all sufficiency, meaning that you're taking care of baseline taken care of, and because you're sowing, because you're faithful to sow, now you have not just what you need, but now you have an abundance for every good work. That means an abundance to continue to sow. That's one piece. But actually, good work also can include an abundance for things that bless you. Amen. For motorcycles. Mike knows all about motorcycles, right? And it would be great for Mike to have an abundance for his motorcycle. You know? Amen. We want to have a good motorcycle, not a broke-down, busted motorcycle. A busted motorcycle is no value. Yeah, see? There we go. Now, now you're picking up what I'm putting down. Motorcycles. Amen. Amen. As it is written, so here he's quoting the Old Testament, he is dispersed abroad he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, in the Old Testament, you know, it was it was sort of down. The people believed that you know, God would disperse to the poor. And that would often be done through um, the king would give in to sort of charity. I mean, we call them charity organizations. It's not the same back then, but similar idea. But in the New Testament, when we're talking about God dispersing abroad, who is he is given to the poor, well, we're God's hands in the New Testament. Amen. We we are the face of God to the world. We're the hands of God in the world. Amen. So when we're, when we're talking about He has given to the poor, it's Christians who are to give to the poor and and tithing to the local church. It's Christians who are to give. Amen. So that His righteousness, His good name, may endure forever. You know. Uh, Mike informed me last week that Kenneth Copeland actually in Afghanistan. When the U.S. pulled out so abruptly and um, and uh, left a, a bunch of Afghani interpreters and people who supported the American military efforts there, Kenneth Copeland himself sent ships, sent well, planes to take out some of the people to help support bringing those people out to safety because the Taliban would have killed them. I think about Dr. Lester Sumrall, who what a lot of people don't know about him because he didn't broadcast it. He didn't broadcast that he was doing this, but he bought a bunch of ships after uh, the Vietnam War, and he filled them with food. And wherever there was famine in the world, usually in Africa, Lester Sumrall would, would send these ships with food to the ports, and he, and he would send people with them to make certain that the food didn't just get taken by the corrupt governments and then resold, because that, that's what a lot of the governments over there will do, even if there's a famine. Let's say the uh, UN likes to take planes and drop aid from the sky in like parachutes. Well, those corrupt governments will take their military and go steal, basically steal the food that's meant for the starving people and then sell it back to the people who are starving at an exorbitant price that, of course, they can't even afford. But Lester Summerall took great pains to make sure that the food that he was sowing into those people who were suffering got to them as best as he could. Amen? And these are just some examples of men who have taken the abundance that they've received and used it for good work. Because what I have learned by observing some of these men is they get a lot of criticism from the world because they may have jets, they may have different things that seem awful fancy. But I know people who are around them and have been around them consistently. And they are some of the most generous people on the face of the planet. They prove that this law of seed time and harvest, of sowing and reaping, is true. Amen? Hallelujah. So, if you're sowing today, if you're sowing by um, e-transfer, um, send it to, to uh, the email is uh, give at promiseoflife.ca. Is that correct, treasurer? Okay. Give, G-I-V-E, at promiseoflife.ca. But if, if you're sowing physically with us today, let's raise it up before the Lord. And we're, and we're, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray, actually, 
verses 10 and 11 of this chapter. Because I don't know of any really better prayer over an offering that exists in, in, in the Bible. I certainly couldn't make one up that's, that, that, that's better. And listen, when we pray in line with the word, we're always right. Amen? That's always the highest flow. Now, Lord, may you who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply, su supply and multiply the seed that we're sowing here today and increase the fruits of our righteousness, Father, while we are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to you, Lord. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that all of the needs of all of the families represented here today who are sowing are met and abundantly supplied for in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father, that all of the needs of Promise of Life Church are met and abundantly supplied for in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Theo, thank you for your support. Next, next week, Theo is going to preach the message. It will be all done by gifts of tongues and interpretation. I don't know who will be interpreting, but it will be exciting. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you for today. Lord, we just thank you so much that we're here today. Father, it's it's so exciting that it's above zero, Father. It's so exciting that, you know, there have been days that have been above zero, but it hasn't felt like it, Lord, because that wind is cold. But praise God, it's nice and warm today. I thank you in the name of Jesus that the black flies go elsewhere today. They may be somewhere, but they will not come nigh us today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for revelation knowledge to flow today. As we, as, as we share what which, which, which you've shared with me yesterday, Lord, this all came yesterday, Lord, as I was working outside in our garden, Father, and even last night as I was praying and preparing for the service. And I know, Lord, that when, when you speak that clearly and you give us this, this revelation this clearly, Lord, that it's specifically for the people who are here. Lord, you're always specific, but I know today is a word in season. For all of us, Father. And so I thank you, Father, that we're attentive. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that revelation knowledge flows into the hearts of everyone listening and everyone present today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So I was outside yesterday. I was actually, when this happened, I was taking um, our ash bucket out to, to dump it out. Um, in the name of Jesus, we won't have to light any more fires this year. I know that tomorrow it's only supposed to get up to like five degrees here, but in the name of Jesus, that won't happen. But in any case, I was, I was, and, and anyway, I was emptying out the ash bucket and I'm literally walking with the bucket down back this way. And God reminded me of the parable of the mustard seed, just out of the blue. I wasn't even thinking about God or anything. I was just thinking about this ash bucket. I should have emptied it like a week ago. It was very heavy. That's what I was thinking about. And he reminded me of the parable of the mustard seed. And he was talking to me about how amazing it is that the most beautiful flowers and fruits and vegetables come from really tiny, unremarkable seeds. Now, if you're starting a garden, you know different seeds are different sizes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, tomato seeds look like tomato seeds. Lettuce seeds are actually quite large. I was shocked at how big they are. Mm -hmm. They're like tiny marbles, like small marbles. But then you get into like, um, you know, Swiss chard seeds. I mean, they're, they're just itty bitty, almost like little pink flecks, mm -hmm. you know, and I cook with mustard seeds. So I know the mustard seeds are also quite small too, but it's amazing how we get these incredible plants that, that are, that nourish us physically, that uh, calm us and help us to relax emotionally from these tiny, unremarkable seeds. It's quite amazing. And if you would look at a seed, you know, without, without knowing that it is a seed, you would think nothing good can come of, it's just a little fleck of dirt it looks like, you know. It looks unremarkable, it looks unimportant, it looks like it doesn't matter. All right, let's go to Matthew 13. Now, there are different versions of the parable of the mustard seed, okay, in, in each of the synoptic gospels. And you're going to say, Pastor Dan, what is that? What's, what's a synopt? What's going on here? Okay, okay, relax, relax, relax. So the synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? They're called synoptic because they all are, are um, they all have a lot of the same stories, 
In them, they're written quite differently, but they each have sort of a, a lot of the same stories and um, parables and things like that. And now John is kind of um, an outlier. When we talk about the uh, synoptics, everyone kind of thinks of John as the ugly stepchild, but it's not actually true. John's my favorite gospel, by the way. We are allowed to have favorites. I, I you know, I didn't know that that you could, that you know people don't realize that, but you can have a favorite gospel. Just don't stay there all the time, because of course the parable of the mustard seed is not in the Gospel of John. So if you only hang out in the Gospel of John, you won't be familiar with this parable. Um, although I dare say, if you live in the Greater Toronto Metroplex, you are very familiar with mustard and mustard seeds because you will be eating many things that have mustard and mustard seeds in them. All right. So Matthew thirteen thirty one, another parable he put forth to them, saying, "So let me explain something. So right now, let us count ourselves. Let us." Let us cast our, our minds back, right? So Jesus is sitting by the sea, okay? Great multitudes are around him. So he went out in a, in a boat and he sat and everybody was sitting on the seashore. So Jesus is sitting on a boat. The wind is gently blowing, you know, blowing his hair back. He looks like a 70s rock star. You know, that's how we all imagine Jesus, right? You know, nice long flowing hair, nice long beard. You know, in, in my head, this is just me being silly, but whenever anyone says, describes Jesus that way, I think of ZZ Top. And, and I just can't get the sunglasses and the hat out of my head. So I imagine Jesus sitting there like the guys from ZZ Top with the sunglasses and the hat on. But in, in any case, so he's sitting in a boat, right? It's gently rocking. The breeze is blowing. The smell of the sea of Galilee is in the air. And he's telling them many parables. So he's, he's teaching parable after parable after parable. And um, we get down to, to verse 31, the parable of the mustard seed. And what, and what he's doing is he's trying to describe to them what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what many of these parables are. He's, he's giving them different sort of um, pictures so they, um, so they can help them understand what he's talking about. Because no one else in the world, and really even in history, really talked about the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God like this, okay, the, the way that Jesus does. So he has to use parables and examples in order to try to help them understand because they don't really have the context to, to pick up what, what he's putting down, so to speak. Uh, so verse 31, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is indeed the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown... It is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. What he's saying is the mustard seed is very unremarkable. Okay, It's a very small seed. It doesn't look like it's going to produce something fancy. But if you actually like would go online and look up a mustard plant, they get extremely large. You know, It's, it's not like a typical Mediterranean herb like basil or thyme or rosemary, which can grow kind of bushy, you know, they can, they can be about this big. But a mustard, I mean, a mustard plant can get the size of a tree, if you let it. It can get huge. Now, a bird's not going to nest in a basil plant, because a basil plant, you know, best possible scenario, it's like this tall, right? A bird's not going to nest there. Birds like, most birds like to nest in trees, okay? So, but they're going to look for a mustard tree, right? Now, why, why does Jesus know this? Well, he's talking about the size of the mustard tree, but he's also saying, the mustard tree is so big and so productive that it can produce, that it can provide refuge for creatures. You know, thyme and basil and parsley and things are great, but they don't offer refuge. Amen? You know, and one, one thing that I would note, too, is that they don't only grow into large plants. A mustard seed, now, Jesus doesn't get into this, but God brought this to me as I was studying last night. If you cook with mustard seeds, like if you make um, Indian food in particular, they use a lot of mustard seeds. There's small seeds, you only need a very small amount of these tiny seeds, and they produce massive flavor, too. And if they're not in a dish that it's supposed to be in, you, really, you know something is missing. You see what I'm saying? They, they're, they're very small. They're unremarkable. And when you're eating it, you won't even see them. You don't see them when they're in there. 
But the flavor is, un is unmistakable. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's, that's table setting. Let's stay in book of Matthew and go to Matthew 17. Because there, there's a connection here with our faith. Growing up, I always thought that he was just talking about sort of this metaphorical kingdom of God, you know, like some sort of amorphous, ethereal idea of the kingdom of God. But in, 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 in chapter 17, it gets real concrete really quickly. So to, to, to give you guys a bit of table setting, a, a bit of background here. So let's go back to Matthew 17, verse, verse 14. And when they, when they had come to the multitude, they being Jesus and some of the disciples, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? That, that is better translated, how long shall I bear with you? How, how long shall I deal with you? He's, he's, he's very upset. How, how long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. So the disciples came to him privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus says to them, he says, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now he was just talking about the kingdom of God being a mustard seed. Just a few chapters before. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. He follows that up with verse 21, saying, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So think about that. Keep verse 21 in the back of your head, but, but our focus right now is on verse 20. Amen? Okay. All right. Our unbelief, and with regards to verse 21, our unwillingness to do things the way God desires them to be done hinders us from so much in our lives. Look, if we would just learn to trust God and act and speak as he instructs, we will accomplish all that he has called us to do. So what, what Jesus is trying to, 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 to say is like, look guys, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever it was that you were doing, you weren't doing it in faith. Maybe they were doing it just because they had seen Jesus do it, right? I'm not sure exactly what they had, what they were saying. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what they were doing to try to cast the demon out. But what he's saying is you, they were not, their, their focus was not in God's, on God's power. Okay. And what, what he's trying to, to teach them is, listen, if you, if you had faith in God's power, the size of a mustard seed, just a little bit of faith, you could have cast this out. But he also gives them additional help with verse 21. He says, listen, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. Now, that's practical advice and information, but he's also, in my be I believe, rebuking them as well. He's like, because what he's saying is, this also requires consecration, okay? Because prayer and fasting requires consecration. That means that your focus is entirely on God, okay? So he's saying, not only do you not have faith, you're also not consecrated to the, this call that you have, the way that you're supposed to be. And we see throughout the Gospels, Jesus, con you see these little like side comments where Jesus went away from them. Jesus went up to the mountain. Jesus came down from the mountain alone. He was intentionally taking time away on a consistent basis to spend time with God. And I, and I believe, of course, fasting too, because he was able to cast the demon out, right? Now, I don't want to get legalistic about this fasting Thing. But the, the point here is that when our focus is on God and when we are exercising our faith, in order for our faith to be effective, we must be consecrated. Again, it's not just about words that we say. It's not just about the things that we do. It's about the fact that we're doing it God's way. You know, um, there, there was a minister that came to our church when we were living in Toronto years, I mean, I'm talking 10, 10, 10 years ago now. And he said something that, that stuck with me. It just went down into my spirit the minute that he said it. He said, faithfulness isn't just doing 
what God tells you to do. Faithfulness is doing it the way God has it in his heart. And that means that when God asks us to do something, our first response is to say, yes, sir. Second question is, how would you like that to be done? And if we ask him that question, he'll show us. And he'll show us how he wants it to be done. And that way, that method, is always going to be the most effective method. So, again, let's take it back to casting out the demon. I, again, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what they did. But whatever they were doing, it wasn't the right thing to do. You know, in, in, in that moment, it wasn't the right thing to do. And that's why Jesus got so frustrated with them. Because he's like, look, look, if you had faith, if you, if you really believed that it was God's power that was doing this, you would have had success. And another thing, if you had been praying and fasting, if you had been had your focus on God, you would have picked up what you needed to do in order to cast this demon out. And if you notice, if, if you look at the healings in the Bible, Jesus almost never heals someone the same way twice. You know, sometimes he spits and puts mud in, in, in people's eyes. Sometimes he just lays hands on them. Sometimes he doesn't even touch them at all. Sometimes he just speaks to them. They, they stand up. Sometimes people just touch the hem of his garment and they walk away healed because of their faith. That, when, when Jesus is doing things differently, I believe it's because God is trying to, God says in this moment, do this, do that, do this, do that. Don't, you know what I mean? If Jesus had just assumed that every time God, he was to heal somebody, he was just to lay hands on them, you know, it wouldn't have been necessarily effective. But I believe God was instructing him each time, okay, do it this way, do it this way. You know, sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, why did Jesus spit in the dirt and make mud and put it on, on, on that guy's eyes? I don't know. I doubt there was some deep metaphysical reason. You know, I, 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 I bet if you asked Jesus, he would be like, well, you know, I just got the sense this is what I was supposed to do. He wouldn't give you this great big philosophical argument as to like how his DNA mixing with the mud created this like spontaneous spiritual thing. And, you know, because then he'd just be spitting mud all over the place and people would have been bottling the mud and then selling the mud and saying, listen, Jesus spit in this mud. Awesome. You know, we, 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 we've all seen those, those, those ads on television, right? Where, where the guys are selling the, the little bottles of, of water from the Holy Land. You've, you all look at me like I'm crazy. You guys haven't seen these? You guys haven't seen these? These are like, listen, if you, if you, if you give me whatever, like 10 bucks, you get this water and you just pour it on yourself and everything's going to be fine, you know? There, Jesus could have had a real cottage industry going if he had just kept spitting in mud and had people package it. I'm serious. Look, look, did, did you guys know that currently there's about 117 nails from the cross of Christ all over the world? 117, supposedly. Now, look, look, how many nails do you think one cross had? Think about, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm being funny, but at the same time, like, my, my point is, my point is this. Jesus could easily have just turned his gift, the, what God had anointed him to do, into a money-making machine. And he could have just ha developed what we would call in show business, like a, a shtick, you know, where you come to Jesus for healing, he, he's, he's going to you know, wave his hands over you or do something and, and, you, and you'll be healed. But that, that, that's not how it is because Jesus was responsive to the leading of the Spirit in the moment. And it wasn't always the same, depending on the given situation. Think about the 10 lepers too. You know, he prayed for them and they got healed on the way. They got healed on the way, you know, that's very different. And then, of course, you've got the, the one of the most incredible miracle, in my opinion, with Lazarus, right? Where he's standing at the mouth of his tomb. He could easily have gone in there, I don't know, picked up Lazarus bodily and carried him out or something. But that's not what God asked him to do. He asked him to do one of the most unremarkable things in history. He stands there. He's He's been... He was weeping because his friend was gone. And God says, just say, just say this. Just say, Lazarus, come forth. And in the Greek, it's not some big fan. You know, we always imagine he's be like, Lazarus, come forth. You know, like some big, like Charlton Heston voice. But in, in the Greek, there's, there's, no, there's no, like, strong command tense there. 
It's just a grieving friend being obedient to what God is telling him to do. He just says, Lazarus, come forth. You know, and everyone's looking at him like he's bonkers. You know, because people have just been criticizing him. Like, why weren't you here, you know, three days ago, four days ago, when he was still alive? You know, not only is, the, is he grieving, all of his friends are mad at him. Because they think that if he was present, he could have changed something. But think, think about how, how much faith it must have taken for Jesus to stay away. To, because you, you know that he knows that he's got something to help. But he has to be obedient to God to stay away. And he comes, and Lazarus is already dead. And everything looks hopeless. I mean, it's not just like when um, Jairus' daughter, right? Because she had just died, like, within a, a couple of hours before. No, no, no. Lazarus has been dead for days. Like, there's a smell. I don't want to get weird, but, like, you know, it's, it's a, there's no evidence that anything can be done to save this man. And his grieving friend, the, 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 the son of God, yes, but in this moment, he's a, he's, a, he's a friend. He's a friend who believes in God's power. He shows up and says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now I'm reading a little bit between the lines. He says, but I believe, he must have said, God, what do you want me to do here? You know, I, I'm here now. It's too late. Everyone is angry at me. You know, you're going through all of those emotions of, of loss. And in addition, everyone's angry at you. I, I, I can't imagine what that must have felt like emotionally. And God says, just speak. Just speak. And he speaks. And Lazarus comes forth. Completely healed. Completely whole. That's faith. And Jesus is saying, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, mountains will move for you. It just, it just, it's very humbling to me because I've been blessed to sit under te te teaching for more than a decade about faith and believing for things. And we've seen miracles happen in, in our lives in many different ways. But if my best friend died, I don't know that I could do what Jesus did. I would want to, you know, dive in and do something, pick him up and shake him or something. You know, you know what I mean? Like do something physical. That's just, that's just how I am. But think about how sensitive to the spirit Jesus had to have been. To not just stay away when it was, not like Lazarus lived hundreds of miles away, but, but, but to stay away. To obey him to stay away. And then when he arrived, to not give in, to not allow his grief to cloud his ability to hear what the Spirit is saying. It's really amazing. It's really amazing. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for being such an example of faith to us. By your witness, you challenge us to stretch ourselves. For Lord, you said that these works that we've seen you do, those that come after it will do greater. Lord, that seems impossible to us. That seems impossible. But we know that with you all things are possible. And if you said it, Jesus, must be true. Lord, help us to grow our faith. Lord, we know that growing our faith is done by sitting under anointed preaching and spending time in the Word. And Lord, we, we covenant now in our hearts to spend more time in that Word. Sit under the preaching that we're called to sit under. We may grow and develop as you've called us to. In Jesus' name. We go to Luke 17. Thank you, Jesus. 
uh, Luke 17 and uh, 24. And we've been talking about faith and the kingdom of, of God. And um, if you look at verse 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 20, the, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of, come, of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Now that sounds very deep, and it and it is. But what he's saying is, the kingdom of God is within the human spirit. All of the capacity of the kingdom of God exists within the human spirit. But that spirit must be born again. And that spirit must be filled with faith for that kingdom to be manifest in the world. You see, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It sits. It sits within every person with unactualized potential. You know, a seed is just a seed until it's put in soil to feed it. Because that, that, that's what soil does. Look, when you plant a seed, how, how many people here know that it doesn't sprout the minute that you put it in? It sits under the soil. You can't see it. You have no idea what's going on down there. Unless you studied like botany or something. But then you won't like it, but you're not actually seeing it. You know what I'm saying? You can't actually see what's going on down there. But underneath, it's putting down roots and it's growing up towards the sun. Why? Because the soil that it's planted in is what nourishes it. Or it doesn't. So it must be planted in the right kind of soil for it to be nourished. So many people, even born again people, go to churches where they're not, their spirit isn't being nourished. So it doesn't develop the way that a mustard tree develops, well, a mustard bush would develop. And what, and we understand this because Jesus is even saying to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you within the Pharisees, within the unbelieving Pharisees. The kingdom of God exists within them. But just like a seed, the seeds don't exist to just stay under the soil. Seeds exist to grow. They exist to grow and develop and produce. Amen? Now, our spirits grow and our faith grows like, uh, like, like we understand as we tend our relationship with God and we tend our attentiveness to spending time with the prayer and we tend our relationship with, with the local church and with our pastor. Amen? Now, God showed me, uh, I hesitate to call it a, a vision because that's what it was, but I don't, it doesn't, I mean, it's not like, well, I'll just say it. You, I think you understand what I'm saying. So I was praying last night, and God showed me a scenario. Okay, I wasn't thinking about this at all. He just showed it to me like a, like a movie. He showed me one of my tomato plants, which if you were to go out on our back deck, you would see them. They're out there right now. They're, they're in containers, 10-inch pots, about this big by this big. That makes sense, everybody? They're smaller than the, the offering vines, Okay. And in the, in the vision, for lack of a better word, I knew that it was time, it was time to pot on the tomato plant, meaning, meaning that it was time to take it from the smaller pot and put it into a larger pot. Okay? Everyone understand what I'm saying? Okay. And when, when I did that, when I went to pull the, the tomato plant out from the smaller pot, I saw that it was root bound. Now, for those, I think a lot of us here know what that means, but for those of us who might be watching via live stream that don't understand, being root bound means that the, the plant has grown as much as it possibly can within that particular environment, and it, the roots are continue to, to push to try to find 
more soil in which to grow outwards, okay? But, 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 but they can't, so it kind of grows in on itself. And it actually can kill the plant if it's allowed to go on like this for too long. So when, when you repot a plant or take a plant like that and put it into the soil or, or um, stick it into a larger pot, you have to kind of tease out the roots a bit so that it will you know, continue to nourish itself and, and expand to fill the pot. And, the, and then I heard the Lord's voice speak. And he said this, he said, just as the tomato became root bound because you were slow to put it in a bigger pot where it would have room to grow, so my people are keeping their faith so confined that it is unable to grow to its fullest potential. And when, when you have these experiences with, with God, I, I kind of intuitively understood what he meant, like my spirit understood what, what, what he meant. What he was saying is, is people, Christians, born-again believers, often can find, we can find our faith. And look, I'm guilty of this too. We, we kind of get to a point with our faith that we're like, okay, I'm, I'm good where I am. I'm fine. Everything's cool. I'm just going to kind of coast. I'm just going to kind of hang out here by the nice, you know, sunny windowsill, imagining that we're tomato plants. And that's cool, okay? Like, it, it's everything seems fine. But under the surface, what we don't even realize is we're becoming root-bound. We are not, be, be, because we're not stretching forth our faith, because we're just allowing ourselves to become complacent, we are stagnating spiritually. We're stagnating. Now, you know, a river is great because the water is constantly moving. But if you dam a river, it creates a like a like a pool or a lake those are also <laughs> fine as long as the water has some way to move and circulate okay but if you've dammed the the river at the wrong point the water will all just back up and it will go nowhere and it won't move and it will stagnate that's when you have an uh, algae start to grow the oxygen drops so the fish start to die. The other wildlife that depend on it can't function. But it takes time for that to happen. It doesn't, ha again, it doesn't happen overnight. In fact, when it comes to water stagnating, oftentimes people don't realize that it's happening until it's happened, right? The water goes from being, okay, clear, fine, and then stagnant. And then you're in big trouble, okay? But it seems okay for a while. And, and what, what, what God is, is saying is, there are so many Christians who are root bound spiritually that don't realize it. And they don't realize how when in faith, when you just stay static, <coughs> when you stay static and you're not exercising your faith, you're, you're, you're not putting yourself out there spiritually, you're not trying to grow spiritually, you're actually hurting yourself over time, over time. Amen? Amen. Christian life is a journey of growth, okay? So again, let's go back to what the Lord showed me last night. We need to recognize, we, we, we need to get spiritually sensitive enough to, to recognize when we're getting root bound, when it's kind of like, okay, we, 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 we're not, you know, our relationship with God isn't really where it should be. I'm not as hungry for him as I used to be. Something needs to change, okay? We need to pot ourselves on in that case. What, what does that mean for us? That means we have to start actively stretching our faith again. We have to start believing for things again. If, if we're disobedient somewhere, we have to recognize that and stop that, that disobedience so that we can start growing. You know, all of the metaphors for the Christian life in the New Testament are all race, journey, uh, perseverance, movement. It's always about movement. It's always about movement. You know, no one calls it the great Christian sit. They call it the Christian walk or the Christian race. Not the Christian jog, the Christian race. Don't get me started with that. That's a different sermon. But we could also call this, this, this journey of growth, this race, sanctification. You know, becoming more Christ-like. And what 
And I believe what, what God desired for me to share today by showing me that vision last night is that we have to keep our desire up. We have to keep our hunger up for him. We have to want to grow. Because if we want to grow, God will provide us more of that nutrient-rich soil in which to plant ourselves and to spread our roots down into. If we don't, that's when we, we cause ourselves to become root-bound. God doesn't cause us to become root-bound. It's because of decisions we've made. But if we choose to stretch out and say, Lord, for lack of a better term, pot me on, you know, stretch, let's, I'm, I'm stretching. Give me a new faith project. Give me something to do. Show me where I'm missing it. Show me, do I need to spend more time praying with you? Do I need to spend more time in the word? What do I need to do? Because I can sense something is not clicking. Right? He will show us. He is faithful. Amen? Can I go a little bit longer? Is everyone okay? No, no, no one's got chicken in, in, the, in the oven or, or anything like that. My, my pastor, Pastor Craig, says that all the time. I don't know anyone that's ever put food in the oven before they went to church. That's crazy. Now, in the crock pot, yes, but that goes for eight hours, right? So you got a lot of buffer. But I don't know, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I assume someone must have done it once for him to continue to say that, but I just, I would never do it. I'm the one that cooks in our house, so I use a lot of food metaphors, and I'm, I would apologize for that, but I'm not going to because... Food, without food, we would starve to death. So, um, Now let's go back to um, the book of Matthew, if we could. Please, we'll go to chapter 5. You'll see why I'm talking about food in just a minute. 5 and 13, please. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It can't be seasoned again. It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So, so this is another way. God showed me another way to kind of talk about the same thing that we've been talking about. Think of ourselves as salt or, you know what, as mustard. Because, you know, if you keep mustard seeds in its plastic bag for too long, it doesn't taste quite as mustardy yet as it did before. You know? No, I'm being serious. The, the whole point of salt is to be used. If you sit, If the salt sits somewhere in a closet and it's not used for long periods of time, it's not going to be as flavorful as it was. And that's what Jesus is talking about. If you were the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It loses its flavor because it's not being used. That's what, that's what causes salt to lose its flavor, right? It's then good for nothing. Now, I'm not saying any of us are going to be trampled, okay? You know, I think some people could read in this a little bit. But if we go to 2 Timothy 2, we'll see Paul talking about exactly the same thing. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 20. I'm trying to wrap up here. You guys are pulling and I'm circling the airport, as they say. All right. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, dishonor, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and fit for the master's use, prepared for every good work. So if, again, we're talking about the same thing. If we continue to pursue what is honorable, to pursue the things that feed us and grow us, we will become vessels. We will become salty. I'm pretty salty. In case you haven't noticed already. Talk about the way that I talk. Talk about the way that I talk. Everyone's looking at me like I'm crazy. Anyway, um, we will become saltier, but we also become refined. We become vessels fit for the master's use. We become vessels of gold and silver. And I would say potentially even titanium and platinum. They didn't have titanium and platinum back then, but you know, titanium and platinum is even better than that gold and silver, right? Uh, but it all comes down to something that we have to do. We have to, like Paul says, cleanse ourselves from, from dishonor. Like Jesus is talking about using, being of use, de desiring to be of use, desiring to stretch ourselves, desiring to spend time with God, asking him to show us how we can deepen our relationship with him 
and thereby deepen our roots, our spiritual roots in the soil that will nourish us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for today, Father. We thank you, Lord, that the, the word has been rich, Father. I know I've been helped today, Father. I thank you, Lord, for revelation of the word that's gone forth, Spirit of God. I thank you that you quicken what, what you desire to get across to each person in the heart of every believer here in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that each person that may be watching over live stream, Father, they also receive everything that you have for them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you all have a wonderful week, and we will see you again very soon. Bye-bye.